Hello and welcome. Welcome all day to people. Welcome to my first stream in a while. Hope this is a good one. It's going to be special and a little bit different because it's actually kind of a reenactment or a new and better improved version uh, of my conference session from ODSC West, which was uh, last week or no, two weeks ago here in San Francisco Bay Area. It was really excellent. It's an awesome conference, um, but I'm not really here to give a plug for ODSC, but if you ever get a chance to go to one, definitely take it up a uh, little disclaimer i'm having i can't hear the music my sound is messed up so if there's any problems with the sound please let me know on the chat but without further ado let me dive into what we're doing here uh, so this is a stream on churn and customer revenue oh thanks for the feedback on the sound Leip Lorenko. i probably can't pronounce your handle but anyway uh, so thank you for that uh, so this is on churn and customer revenue. So I'm just gonna dive right in. This is basically the workshop that I showed at ODSC. Um, so there's a branch for this demo that has the simulation uh, and the code that we're going to run. And I'm actually going to go through just downloading it and doing it. Felipe Lorenco, Brazil. Okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so, Oh yeah, you do need to have Python, Postgres, and some way of running Python. I prefer an IDE, and that's what I recommend to people I know and people who work with me. A lot of people are into notebooks, and if you're into notebooks, you know, that's your thing, that's cool. So let's see, I am going to actually do this um, the old fashioned way. Actually, I need to get out of here. I'm going to go and download, I should have the GitHub repo already open. So there is a branch on it. Uh, if you search for ODSC, whoops, we should find it. There we go. 22.11.03 ODSC, that was the day of the, the presentation at the conference. So I am just going to download it right now before your eyes. And that only took a fraction of a second not that much so let's get started okay here's my download that i just downloaded and i have a folder here for the demo so i'm going to go into that one and unpack it all right so there's my code and let's see i'm going to go back to my ide well actually i'll go back for a second to the slide deck because this is also how I remind myself what I'm supposed to do. So I'm supposed to set up and anyone who wants to try this later or while following along, you set up, you create a project, set the virtual environment and the root folder um, in your project. So let me do that. I am going to, actually my IDE is open in the other window but I'll drag it over in just a sec. I'm gonna create a project. Um, I'm going to pick my new folder if it will oblige any day now. Okay, so here's my new project. I'm going to open and let's see. The other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use a previously configured interpreter because I happen to have one, um, which will just make this go faster. It would be a lot slower if I had to install all the requirements right now. So I am just going to use uh, my old interpreter uh, from my other fight churn project for this one. Okay, that's going to give me my project. Now I create it. Oh, and it puts up this little window for me. It's putting everything up in the other window, but I will show you everything. Create from existing source is what you do right now. And I make this note here, if you had a fight churn main branch installed from a while ago, you need to upgrade SHAP, the SHAP package to run this. I've pushed that to the main uh, branch now. So if you just install the main branch now, you'll get the newer SHAP. But when I, when I started making this, it was crashing because I had like the old SHAP. All right, so what's my next step here? I've got my project open. I've got to set my source uh, root folder. This is equivalent to setting the Python path. Um, this is how you do it in, um, wow, this is actually reminding me, this is probably way too small for y'all. I'm sorry, I always like to stream in a big font. 
Um, and I'll be honest, because I haven't streamed for a while, I don't, I'm a little bit rusty. And let's see, general, no, I want to go up here. The reason I'm rusty is because I haven't streamed for a while. I've just been crazy busy at my day job. I don't know if you know, if you follow me on like LinkedIn or something, I started a new job um, at a very cool startup called OfferFit, which I will, should get a chance to tell you more about later. Um, whoopsie, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's go back here. What the heck was that doing though? I don't want this going to YouTube right now. <laughs> All right, so here we are back again. I, oh wait, I changed those preferences. I was telling you about how I'm crazy busy at a new startup. And what I've got to do to finish this setup is set my project directory, which is just to tell it where all the code lives. And this is how you do it in PyCharm. If you're in uh, VS Code, it's something a little different, but I'm sure there's a way to make that setting. And that is all there is to it. Um, that should be the end of the setup. Let me go back here and check. Yep, that should be it. So let's go on and to the next part. So there's a simulated data set. And if you're familiar, if you've read flight term data or know what this is about, I do a lot with simulated data. Why? Well, the reason is that um, it's hard to get real churn data because <laughs> it's really it's data about companies and their customers. Uh, and even if there's no PII or sensitive, you know, personal information in it, it's very strategic and sensitive, important data for those companies. So they're not just giving it away and posting it on the internet. So one of the main victories of my work here was actually creating a simulation which can kind of give you close to real life experience in churn data science techniques without the real data. So the simulation in the book only has um, a single price point for the customers, although it talks about some techniques for multiple price points. And here we have a new simulation with different price points for the customers, and it's going to dem demonstrate the con the concepts. <laughs> sorry. Uh, of revenue and churn and where revenue shows up in your churn rate and where revenue shows up in your machine learning analysis. So it's going to be a simulated online CRM or customer relationship management system with three levels of subscription, a basic, standard, and premier. Let's see. So that is what we're going to do. So how do we run this simulation? Okay, first we need to set a few environment variables and then we run this uh, script which will create the schema. So you need a Postgres database set up already. I'll show you mine here in PG Admin. So if you look, my these are my schemas right now. I have a BizNet one, ebook site. These are various things I've worked on if you've looked at my other streams. Let me go back here and I'm gonna add a configuration to run that first script which is gonna create the database. Let's see, I want a Python script. Um, I'm just going to select it here by going into fight churn and then we're in data gen because we're, we're making the simulation. So there's my churn DB uh, uh, script to run. I need to add those environment variables now. So I'm going to do this the, the lazier way and go over here and just like copy these out. <laughs> Or the it's the it's the less error prone way. You all know that copy paste is better. So my churn DB is just called churn. That's easy enough. Um, my churn DB user is my first name. So for me, this is just Carl. And let's see, churn DB password. My churn DB password. It's not very secure. Can you guess what it is? Can anyone guess my password? No, no one wants to guess my password. <laughs> it's churn. <laughs> so that's kind of stupid, but hey, you know, it works. And I think there's one more, okay, an output directory. This is where all the artifacts created by the program are going to go. And I'm gonna go back to where we were here, I'm actually going to use a little Mac trick. I'm going to copy that folder uh, and then go to my terminal and paste it to get the path. 
that's a good trick to know if you're on a Mac and there's probably a similar trick on other systems. So back here, this is gonna be my output directory and that should be it. So I should be ready to run the first script. And what this script does, whoops, okay, is creates the database. Let's see if it works, see if I got all that right. All right, so creating schema biznet2, I'm gonna go back to my PG admin and see if that worked by refreshing here. And there we go, there's my new schema and it has some tables. Um, show you real quick, accounts, metrics, subscriptions. We're gonna look at all of these a little bit more in a minute, but for right now, uh, <laughs> yeah, my password is, a little bit better than password, but it's uh, not much better if you know that this is all about churn. <laughs> so let's see, back to my next steps. Okay, I'm supposed to run the simulation, which is churnsim.py, and the easy way to do that if you're using an IDE is to make a new configuration. Here, I just copied the old one, and I'm just gonna point it at the new script. And that is much easier than entering uh, new configurations because it copies your environment variables. So once I launch this, it's going to start generating the data. And let's see, let's see if this starts to work. And copy time. Hmm. It's a little bit weird, okay. I didn't expect there to be data in that. Wait a second. Oh no, I ran it wrong, I entered the wrong thing. That's like my little safeguard on not deleting old data. And I have to enter the exact name of the schema here and then it's gonna start going. Okay, so now it's running the simulation and this is uh, this will take a few minutes for me and hopefully it won't take too much longer for you. My computer is from like 2019, so it's not exactly state of the art and yet it can still do this you know, reasonably fast. So while this is running, I'm going to say a little bit more. I mean, hey, we're here to here to live stream. This is also a good time if anyone has any questions or anything. Oh, there's a typo. It says schema. I'll have to fix that later. But let's get back to the basics. This is some of the stuff I do at the beginning of my conference session. Although here I, I ran the simulation first. Um, so what is churn? If you don't already know, you probably know. Churn is customers quitting, canceling, unsubscribing, unfollowing, or just not coming back and buying stuff if it's retail. Um, the origin of the term is from churn rate, which we're going to look at a lot of churn rates later. Um, which means the percentage of customers that drop out. It can actually mean a few other things as we're gonna see later in the stream. And churn is now also a noun and a verb, um, which could be like the customer churns, um, or even I'm gonna churn from Netflix cause I finished watching Stranger Things and there's nothing else good on Netflix now. Mm, that's actually not quite true. Got a few things still in my queue on Netflix. So I'm not churning from Netflix yet. Um, but you just heard me use churn as a verb. <laughs> anyway, you can also use churn as a noun and say like make a churn report on this quarter's churns or even that customer is a churn because they canceled last week. Did I have to tell you all this? Uh, churn is now the world's most common data science problem, uh, I, I say, because every company wants recurring revenue. And if you are getting recurring revenue, that means you have a churn problem, you know, when you lose your recurring revenue. Let's see. Philippe Laurent says, back propagation is a type of cross validation that regards temporal features of the data. Where can I read more about it? Okay. Backpropagation is not a type of cross-validation. Exact, no, it's a, it's a little bit scrambled. Backpropagation is a way of training a neural network by propagating the errors from the end of the network back to the front of the network. And cross-validation is a way of comparing network parameters, really hyperparameters is what they call it. So you do cross-validation when you wanna try different models. Like let's say I wanna compare um, back propagation in a neural network to gradient boosting, um, which is a lot more useful for churn. 
um, and you can compare them with cross validation. You can also compare, you know, make sure your model's not overfit by cross validating. So where you can read more about back propagation and cross validation is definitely Wikipedia. I always go to Wikipedia first for everything because do you guys ever see there was like a, a some episode oh, of like the odd ones out with Iffypedia or am I confusing my series here? Iffypedia. <laughs> oh, back testing. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Okay, back testing is a type of cross validation, and I think I'm gonna say um, a little bit about it here. Oh, the one you. Okay, you read the book. Got it, Felipe. Um, where you can read more about back testing? Well, they call it time series cross validate or time series split rather in uh, pandas or no SK Learn. Ah, confusing my packages. Where can you read more about back testing? I don't know. I probably would also look on Wikipedia because um, that is you know a way you know it's a good first pass. Um, but yeah, it's time series split in SK Learn back testing to the old finance people. But anyway. Well, let's check real quick how the simulation is doing. Okay, still running. 5,300 out of 10,000 customers simulated. So I still have time to keep talking. What is fighting churn with data? If you don't already know, um, it's my book based on experiences doing a lot of churn analyses. Uh, I was at two different companies. First, a small startup um, you never heard of, and then a big startup called Zora that went public, and they're still a public company. I did a lot of churn work, and that was the source of knowledge that I based the techniques in the book on. If you don't already have the book, or if you want anything else from Manning, here's a discount code. This was the code I distributed at the conference, and it's good for like a month uh, at least. I think it might be two months from the date of the conference. So this code will give you 35% off anything at Manning for a while right now, um, if you need that. Or if you actually don't have my book, hey, there, there's your chance. All right, let's keep going. What is fighting churn with data? Really, it is data-driven churn fighting. And what is data-driven churn fighting? There's a few ways to save customers. One is to make your product great without using surveys, which are always biased. Two is to price your products so that you give customers value and not discounts. Um, lots of people think that if you want to reduce churn, you give someone a discount when they threaten to churn. But in the long run, that undercuts the value proposition of your product. So that's not really a great way to do it. The better way to do it is like what I'm demoing in this simulation is to have a basic um, a standard and a premier plan, or even to use value-based pricing where you people pay as you go for various you know goods on your platform. But don't give out discounts. Well, I should say never give out discounts. It has to be targeted. I'll say a little bit more about that at the end when we talk about, I'll say a little bit about my current company. But don't just give a discount to everyone. You only give discounts to customers where the lifetime value is gonna make up for the discount. Anyway. Another way to fight churn is customer success, which is training and onboarding the right customers at the right time. It's You've probably heard of customer support, which is how you help people when they call in. Customer success is actually more proactive. Um, yeah, discounts could be loyalty-based because, you know, um, the, the Loche, I don't know if you're pronouncing that right, but yeah, you could give out discounts based on the length of time. In general, you want an estimate of the future net present value of, you know, the, the lifetime value of the customer in order to, you know, make that decision about discounts. And loyalty could be a big part of that. Okay, you can also fight churn with marketing, which is targeted messages, which are hopefully useful to the customer and not just like annoying. Um, mostly they're annoying anyway. And lastly, you can kind of target your acquisitions. Ooh, I'm kind of sort of covering up covering up the lower right of my slide here well this is about targeting your customers i'm gonna like do a live like edit oh, okay there <laughs> not supposed to do that when you're live streaming but identifying the best customers and focus on them um and that i say is the worst way to fight churn because you're not actually preventing customers from churning you're just doing a slightly better job of finding new ones also, most companies can't get all of their customers from one preferred channel. So you're really better off if you can do something, these other methods, which are all more proactive. All right, let's see how the simulation's doing. 
up uh, 97,000, 9,700 out of 10,000. We're getting there. I always forget these things take longer. Like things like simulations take longer when you're live streaming because live stream is such a CPU hog is the sad truth. Um, but we're almost there and I hopefully have a few more things to say. Okay, it's going into the new customer generation phase of the simulation. That's good. So the simulation starts out with a base of customers. I and then it adds more um, as it goes. And as they, in the simulation, they use the product and they churn out. And then you also have some growth of new customers. Um, oh, well, the Loach, it's great to be new to learning about churn. I think it's a great way to learn data science. And it's very likely to be a useful you know, problem to know about. Because like I said, so many companies now are fighting churn. Oh, can I place the discount code in chat? That is a great idea. Let me go back and actually just like copy paste it because I don't have it. Um, let's see. That is a great idea. Come on, copy. All right, let's go discount code. All right, and what's the other question? Does backtesting validation substitute the statistical validation, F statistics and T statistics, for example, linear regression model and parameter significance evaluation? Kind of, yeah. Um, it's usually a different use case. If you're doing detailed linear regression with parameter significance, it's usually because you wanna make strong statistical conclusions about what you're doing. But it sort of substitutes that for that in the machine learning context, um, where in the machine learning context, you don't really care about the statistical significance of this or that parameter. You really only care about, are you forecasting accurately and are you forecasting accurately in real time on out of sample customers? So it does sort of substitute for those, but it's kind of in a different situation, you know. Um, Okay, so this is the overview of this uh, this stream, and there's an intro. Oh, good, glad that helped you, Felipe. Uh, so this is an overview. I've already done an intro, and we're doing the setup and churn data simulation. Then the first real topic will be varieties of revenue sensitive churn rate calculations in SQL. So there's a few different uh, churn rate calculations that handle revenue in different ways and we'll look at those a next one is doing 10 years scaled metric features um, with a little emphasis on using revenue in them although really this is just a general useful technique from the book and then we'll do some machine learning uh, with XGBoost and explain the results with SHAP values and we'll look at what the results are for revenue and churn because uh, it's very realistic in the simulation. And at the very end, I'll talk about some challenges for machine learning with machine learning for churn, uh, reinforcement lear learning, and my current company offer fit. So because this was a conference presentation, this is based on a conference presentation, it's kind of like a smorgasbord of many, many different topics from the book and just, you know, from my, my life and experience. So that's what we've got in store. And let's just look if the simulation is done. Great, the simulation is done. So now to get, let's get more into the data, I'll show you a little bit of what the simulation has produced. So far, we have produced a bunch of subscriptions. Let's see, uh, view, let's look at the first 100 rows. Customer revenue is similar way calculation like ARPU. Yes, exactly. Um, maybe I should start calling it ARPU because I hear more and more people using the term ARPU. I was using MRR a lot and that's what I, I've stuck with that habit. MRR is, well, the difference is ARPU is generally average revenue per user. At monthly recurring revenue MRR is the specific revenue of one particular user. So here we're seeing in the subscriptions, we have an MRR column, which can be 10, 50, or 100. Um, they're supposed to be randomly distributed at the beginning, and then during the simulation, people will kind of find their level, hopefully. And if we took a bunch of these to get and average them together, we'd, be, we'd have ARPU, which would be the average revenue per user. Or did you mean annual revenue per user? That's, an, I guess, another ARPU. Uh, hmm. And I've heard, I've heard ARPU and MERPU for monthly revenue per user. 
Uh, I kind of like MRR better than Merpu, though. It, I mean, in English, that sounds like poo, which is, you know, poop. So let's not go there. This is a family-friendly stream. <laughs> All right, so let's get started on doing something real and talk about churn rates. So the first churn rate is standard uh, logo. We, we call it logo churn in business to business software because each customer, you call them a logo in the sense, well, if they're big enough, they have a logo. And so each customer, you call them like a logo. So, so this is just based on the count of customers that churn. Um, so it's the number of churns divided by the number of customers at the start. That's a very simple formula. The key thing is it's over a time period and you count the number of churns in that time period and then you get the number of customers, we'll divide it by the number of customers that you had at the beginning. It does not reflect upsell or downsell of customers on your plans, which can be good or bad depending on the situation. So it's good to ignore price changes when you have transient discounts, like let's say you have a summer discount campaign and if you included, you know, downsell revenue, it, the, the lowering of revenue in your churn, you'd think that your um, your discounts had given you, you know, some law so churn, but it's not really churn. Also, if you have only a few prices and they're not too far apart, you probably wouldn't bother with the standard uh, well, you wouldn't worry about the, the difference in prices. And then it's just simpler to use the logo churn or standard churn. Okay, Guarazomp says, ARPU has a lot of calculation way that's the point. Decide which one is the best. One can be monthly, annual, or per quantity of purchase. Okay, yeah, so you're meaning uh, average revenue per user. Oh yeah, and you said that in your previous chat, sorry. <laughs> um. Okay, so back to standard churn. It's interesting from a technical point of view because you calculate it using outer join to find accounts that dropped out. Now, I find that interesting because how often in real life do you use an outer join? Well, this is a very good example. So to run this in the book, you use this script, run churn listing. And if you're already familiar with the book, you've seen it. It's because in the book, code comes in like little snippets uh, or SQLs or single functions. And the run churn listing is a wrapper to run one listing from the book, which is what they call a piece of code in the book. I didn't know that until I got more involved in code books, but they, they often call a, a piece of code in the book as a listing. So let's, I'll show you now running run churn listing, chapter two, listing two. What I'm gonna do is go back here and make yet another configuration by copying my old one. I'll call this one churn calc, uh, and I have to change the script to the run churn listing script. If this thing will oblige, come on, little folder, open, there we go. So I have to go up one, and here I'll find the run churn listing script. And now I have to do chapter, whoops, I'll need a double dash on that. Chapter two, whoops fat fingers listing two uh, and so now this should run the standard churn calculation it's gonna kind of like shoot by on the screen uh, and give you the output let's actually look at the code I think that'll be better and it's better to look at the code um, in the IDE so this is the churn rate SQL calculation and I'll just like talk you guys through it real quick, hopefully move this over. So you have a date range, which I kind of declare up at the top to make it clear and reuse these um, in different variables. And then there's two separate SQLs, one that selects the accounts at the beginning and at the end. I should say they're C the, properly these are CTEs or common table expressions. Um, so this selects um, accounts from the subscription table where their start date is before, on or before the date of our, the, we're starting the calculation, and their end date is after the ending calculation, or it could be null. Um, in my turn simulation, um, there is an end date on every subscription, which we can see back here. They have a start date and an end date. Um, in many systems, uh, 
people who haven't churned yet, whoops, have no end date. So that's why this is basically just a standard SQL that you can use for other systems that don't end date um, live subscriptions. So we have start accounts and end accounts is very similar except we're using the end date um, of the from our, our parameter CTE. Now here's the outer join. The churned accounts is the start accounts left outer join the end accounts. And if you know what that means, it means we'll have a row in the in the result for every start account. Uh, and that's the left part of the left outer join. And then where the account ID uh, exists in the end accounts will fill in the end account ID but then the trick is we select where the ending account ID that's E is null so that means we actually end up selecting the start account IDs of those accounts that drop out and that's the key to uh, calculating a, a standard churn rate with SQL and then the rest of this is just doing like a start count uh, and a churn count. And then here's actually uh, the churn rate here is the number that churn divided by the number at the start. And these are the casting statements in Postgres. Because yeah, you, you have to cast to float or you don't get uh, a proper answer from the integer, integer division because it'll always be less than one. So that's the standard churn rate calculation. And this is like a, a summary this is kind of more what I showed at the conference. Um, but here's the key section is start accounts, left outer join, end accounts, where ending account ID is null. So in the simulation, we're typically getting around 3.6%. Let's see what my actual result was. So when you run the script, it prints out the SQL that it ran. Um, it's actually pasting in the dates here. In the, the, the stored SQL in the code, it's got these binding variables. Um, and then in the final result, okay, we've got, yes, very close to 3.6%, 0.0357, although it'll vary from run to run of the simulation because it is, you know, a random simulation. And that is from 350 churns, uh, 9,800 at the start of the calculation. All right, Philippe A. Laurent, why, why did you choose the date range you use in your book to make social date seven? To match the overall churn rate and make the analysis balance, or is there another reason? Well, yeah, it was the date range. Why did I choose that specific date range? I think I was just choosing like a month apart, uh, four one to five one. In the book, I'm back in. It's in. It's ancient history now. It's in like 2020. I think all the dates are. So I updated the dates for this simulation, and for this calculation, I was just choosing dates about one month apart because this is typically how you would measure churn. Uh, between the first of the month of one month and the first of the month of another month. You could use the end, the end of the month um, two, one, two months apart, but I'll tell you a trick. It's a pain in the butt to use end of the month dates for everything because they change every month. It's like, so it's always better to use the first of the month because then your code is much simpler. Often business people want to use the end of the month because that's how they think. But people who actually have to code this always use the first of the month if you can because then your code is just way better um and yeah the the dates in social net seven i think it's just the same in 2020 uh month apart anyway so let's look at the next type of churn which is net retention now this one calculates the retained revenue from customers that did not churn um, and here it's a similar formula to the churn one. Uh, it's the ending revenue divided by the starting revenue. So you're always doing it relative to something at the start. And this is an interesting churn calculation because again, it's the, it's the retained revenue from customers that did not churn. So for one thing, first thing to know, if all customers pay the same price or if your service is free, um, the, then the standard churn equals 100% minus net retention. It actually ends up being the same. Um, however, if you have multiple prices, then you can have upsells canceling churn because some customers churn and you lose their res revenue, but some customers may upsell. Some may even downsell, but hopefully your upsells are happening faster than your downsells. Um, so then net retention can actually be greater than 100%. Um, and it often is for successful SaaS companies or software as a service companies. 
Um, net retention greater than 100% is sometimes called negative churn. So people say, can you have negative churn? The, the technical answer is no, you can't have negative churn. But you can have um, net retention greater than 100%, which is kind of like negative churn. So I think this is not a good metric to use if you're actually trying to reduce your churn. Why? Because making upsell the you know mixing the upsell with the churn makes it harder to understand it conflates your upsell rate with your actual churn rate and that's a little bit of a distortion but it can be very good for outside uh, for public relations with outside investors. So everyone loves to report net retention to their investors because it masks your underlying churn rate. And if you have more upsells outweighing your churns, then you can pretend like you don't even have a churn rate, even though you can have a surprisingly high churn rate um, and still have uh, net retention greater than 100%. Truth. All right, so let's look at the net retention. Ooh, it's scrolling off the bottom here. I think my font's got messed up but this is 2.1 um, it's actually the first listing it's calculated using an inner join so it's actually a little bit simpler that's why in the book I do it first if, if you ever wonder why did I do net retention first it's just a little bit simpler here we'll run it and so we remember we had a churn rate of 3.6 percent um, we can look at the code here and we have a, it's basically very similar code. Um, we have the start accounts and the end accounts with a similar calculation, but we're also taking the MRR uh, or revenue for each person. Now, why do I use a sum, a group by account here? That's in case there's multiple subscriptions with add-ons. Now we don't, like where you have a second subscription for some extra part of the product. Now in the simulation, we don't have that, but this is just the general uh, sequel from the book, which is designed to work for multi-subscription add-on products. So we've got the, the, the start and end account, MRR. The retained accounts now is a, is a good old fashioned inner join on start accounts and end accounts. And then we just sum the ending MRR uh, for the retained accounts. And then the final calculation is just a simple division, retain MRR divided by start MRR. And if we look down here, we have about 104% uh, net retention rate. This thing just dumps out all the digits. Sorry about that. And you can see the net MRR churn rate is minus 4%. So this is a, a very ha happy company. They're actually upselling more than their customers are churning. Um, and yeah, so that's basically net retention. This is again, reviewing it. The key part is start accounts, inner joined, end accounts. Boy, that font is probably too small for anyone to read. Uh, but I did this in a conference on a big screen. If you look at my old live streams, I use much bigger fonts because I know a lot of people will look at this on their phone and yeah, sorry people, that's what it is. So we do the inner join and here we've got about 104% uh, net retention. Okay, let's look at the last and most kind of most useful churn for revenue, which is explicitly revenue churn or MRR churn. Now this churn counts your total revenue lost, including downsell, but actually not including upsell. So it's really just losing what you, you know. So it's churn dollars or whatever your currency, of course, plus downsell divided by the revenue at the start. And this is best for companies with widely varying prices, like enterprise SaaS, or even if you just have like, you know, a uh, basic standard and premier that are significantly far apart, this is what you want. This is the most complicated one to calculate because you use an outer join uh, to find the churns, just like in standard churn, and then an inner join to find the down cells, like in revenue churn. So let's see, let's look at it in the code and run it. Here's two, four. I'll go here uh, and run this one. We can see the result. So like in the previous SQL, just like in net retention, we've got start accounts with revenue, end accounts with revenue. Then we have one CTE common table expression for the churned accounts where we're doing left outer joined and uh, start accounts, left outer join, end accounts, 
where the ending account ID is null, so we've lost them, but we take their total MRR from the start, which is what you lost. Then we've also got the down cell accounts, which is the inner join end accounts and start accounts. Now we put in the condition that the ending MRR is less than the starting MRR. That's what actually makes it a down cell. Um, if that wasn't clear, down cell means someone who moves to a lower plan. I should, I don't think I said that clearly at the start. And then this is the down cell amount, the start minus the end. And then the rest of these selects just kind of add things up um, for each um, and for each CTE. And then like in the formula, we have churn MRR plus down cell MRR divided by start MRR. And in this case, we've got a 5% uh, MRR churn rate. Uh, so it's actually worse than their regular churn rate. So they're only losing 3.6% of their accounts per month, but they're losing 5% of their revenue um, through a, basically through the down cell, adding the down cells in there. All right, this is once again, the. it's meant to be the summary. It's probably too small for you to see, but We've got both conditions, uh, outer join for the churned accounts, inner join for the down cell accounts. We get about 5% churn results. So let's talk about the relationship between these, the different churn rates. For consumer products with a relatively small price change, you'll generally find what we found here, that the MRR churn or revenue churn is the greatest. Uh, the standard churn is in between and the net retention churn is the lowest. That's because revenue churn is pessimistic. It includes downsell with churn, but not upsell, which it doesn't sound fair. I mean, and you can argue that that's unbalanced, but the thing is upsell is seen as a sales activity, whereas churn and downsell is churn. So. You're, it, you, it does make sense when you think about it. But standard customer churn is neutral. Um, it ignores the amounts that customers pay. And net retention is the most optimistic because it allows upsell to cancel churn. So let's just, next let's say a little bit about some other situations you might find, which is for enterprise software, where you have some very high prices, a large price range, and you also have very big customers. That's kind of key. If you have very big customers, they tend to churn less because they're more invested. So you typically find for enterprise software that standard churn is the highest. It's greater than your MRR churn, which is still, net retention churn is still the most optimistic. Now, why is standard churn higher than MRR churn for enterprise software? It's because you may have very large customers um, who they do an IT implementation for something. It takes them months just to get set up and live. You know, they don't churn so easily because they're more invested. Um, they tend to use the product more too if it's successful. So just by that fact that the big companies that pay the most are more invested, they're gonna have a lower churn rate. So then your standard churn is kind of dominated by the small companies. So when you look at MRR churn, it's actually lower because many of the companies that are churning are the companies that have the lowest MRR or revenue. So that's kind of an advantage of being an enterprise software product uh, in churn that you know companies are more invested, the setup is is more intense. But I'll tell you, as an enter someone who works in enterprise software, it's a challenge because you have the setups are difficult. It's very it's much easier to onboard you know small customers uh, you know through an app um, and a UI. With large customers, you do integrations, which can take a long time. Believe me, I know. All right, so if no one has any questions, that's the end of the first part, uh, the first segment on churn rates. And now we'll go into looking at customer metrics, which is gonna allow us to do some more analysis. So this is a review, a whirlwind review of some topics that are covered in depth in the book. So if you've never heard, seen this before, this is, you know, the, the chance. Uh, if you have seen this before, bear with me, we'll get to some new material uh, in about, 10 minutes or so, um, or come back in 10 minutes. You can go check your other, your other favorite streamers, but please do come back, ha ha. So you calculate customer metrics when you have customer events like the ones shown here. 
you might have user one and user two both log in at different rates and different times. And these are just point in time events. So a simple way to uh, analyze this is to count the number of events per month for each customer. That makes them comparable. Um, and this is using, I illustrate a four week month. I always recommend using four weeks for a month in churn modeling because then it's aligned to user behavior, which is usually on a weekly cycle. But so in this case, you know, we see that the first user might have like two logins in the first period, four logins in the second period, etc. The second user, somewhat more logins, four, six, four. So this is the concept of a customer metric. And if you're thinking this sounds like a feature for machine learning, it is. This is going to be, you know, the machine learning feature. But right now we're just talking about a measurement of a customer which could have a lot of other uses. So the basic customer metric can also be calculated in SQL. And I strongly advocate doing all of this in SQL. A lot of people do this in pandas, uh, which is a, a mistake. It doesn't scale up to big data. Um, and it, there's, there's other reasons why you don't want to like do this in pandas. Pandas is a real memory hog if you haven't experienced it. But um, so here in the book, it's chapter three, listing one. We can see it right here. It's actually just a simple aggregation with the date range. Now I set, sticking to my pattern, I set the parameter in a little CTE, and then the metric is just count star from events between a certain time range where the event type has one stage. Hey, I haven't shown you the events yet, actually. Let's actually go back to the data. So during the simulation, we also generated these events. They don't actually look like much if we look at them here. Um, we can see this is a count one, and these are all point in time events stored in the manner of a data warehouse. Um, each event has a specific date and time, and they also have a, a type ID. So I was actually doing like a properly normalized kind of database schema. Um, and the event types in the simulation, we can see in this little table, uh, we have just about eight events. So this isn't really more complicated than the simulation in the book. The events are searching, closing opportunities, uh, which means getting your deal closed in software, uh, advancing the stage of an opportunity. If you're familiar with sales pipelines, you've got a, a stage from when someone first contacts your company or expresses interest through the different stages of the sale, typically meeting with a customer, doing a demo, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have all those stages here, I should. Uh, in a future version of this simulation, I'll do all that promise. Uh, we've also got losing opportunities, which means that you lost the deal to a competitor. You can track competition by adding competition. Uh, and there's also these events for meet for meetings held. So let's look, let's actually uh, got to do the code demo. So I'm going to go back here and run what this basic calculation. I'll make a new parameter here because I'll call this one metric calc. Uh, and this will be chapter three listing one. And this is just the most basic form, but you can see what this does is it does that aggregation I was telling you. And in any second, it will give us the result. So we've got for each account, the sum of their events. This is advanced stage per month, which we call that because it was calculated over a month. All right, let's go to the next more advanced version which is a multi-date metric calculation. That last calculation was okay, but you're only calculating once a month, which is not often enough to keep track of your customers. But you can still do these monthly windows, you just stagger them, which is illustrated here. Um, you calculate each week. I advocate usually weekly calculation. Customers don't change that much every day in most applications, so you can usually get away with a once a week calculation. If, you're, if it's a very fast paced consumer product, you might have to do this every day. Or if you just have a really big data warehouse and a big budget and a lot of money to burn, you might wanna do it every day anyway. Um, so the, 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 the multi-date metric calc will kind of fill in these, in, these, these dates in between the monthly calc. Um, it's a very similar SQL as before. 
I've just replaced the single date with a series um, in the in the date value CTE. Now you can kind of see why I put that one variable in a CTE. It didn't seem to make any sense before, right? Um, but it's still just count star for the metric and we're doing metric dates in these 28 day intervals. And of course, because this is a code demo, we should go and run the code. This is now listing two. And this one takes a few more seconds because it's calculating for more dates. Um, and you notice we're not actually saving the metrics yet. These are just the demo versions of the SQL. Listing one and listing two are just kind of showing you, you know, what it looks like. Eventually, we're actually going to save these in the database um, so we can use them. But as usual, computer is slow when you're live streaming. So hopefully the music gives you something else to think about. Oh, well, or I can answer a question from PK Patricia. What is meant by CTE? That is a common table expression, which is like a subquery, um, but it's technically a subquery is something different. So you see how my big SQL is broken up into named smaller SQLs. Each one of these is a CTE or common table expression. I'll actually type that in the chat in case my I'm talking too fast. <laughs> it's hard to parse my words. Um, yeah, so that's what a CTE is. And so here's the result from that first SQL. You can see in the first 10 rows, we're only we're still in looking at one customer, but we're calculating a result for them for every week. So you can see their usage is kind of fluctuating up and down, eh, holding pretty steady around 120 to 130 days per month. So it's a monthly rate, even though I'm calculating it every week. And that's the trick. All right, let's go back to the next more calculate, more complicated, more advanced version of the metric. The problem is that this is going to solve is what do you do with a rare event, um, which you will have. Believe me, if you have, if you monitor a lot of events in your software, you're going to have some events that are very rare. And you might have a pattern like this where a user makes, has the event once in one month and they go three months without having the event and then they have it in another month. Um, and the simple trick to do here is to use a longer time window, in this case, say six months, and calculate an average events per month. And then you'll get something like the events per month is 0.33, which is less than one, telling you that they do it, you know, infrequently. But this is much more useful, actually, than these one, than just doing, having so many months with zero. Because then if you look at this customer in a month when it's zero, well, you think it's just zero. Or if you look in a lucky month, you think it's one. But it's more useful to get a non-zero value for as many customers as possible by uh, calculating this kind of uh, multi-month average. So the SQL for this is very similar. Um, it's again, just a simple aggregation. But now we're putting in the scaling factor, in this case, 28 over 84, um, because it's gonna be uh, 84 days is, what's that, like uh, 12 weeks. Um, so here, and we're using the time interval is also 84 days. You know, I should show you guys these sequels in the IDE, because it just looks better. Um, Let's see, which one? Oh, actually, no, although now I believe we're all the way up to chapter seven, because this was considered an advanced metric um, in the book. And let's see, what did I say it was? Chapter seven, listing seven. So this is the scaled metric SQL. You can see in the code, it actually has binding variables for the description period and the observation period, is what I call them. Um, and this is the observation period for your um, time window. So let's see. So let's run this one. I guess I'll just stay in the same command. I'm going to update this ch chapter seven, listing seven. This one will also, if you remember, run the script first, then keep talking, because then we don't have to wait so long. But it's a coffee break for me. So here we're using the event um, lose opportunity, which is relatively rare in this data because we have great salespeople using this CRM, or maybe it's the CRM that makes them great. 
Um, so here we see that for most customers, um, the total count is not that great. And so we're getting averages below one, 0 0.38, 0 0.76, etc. Now that's a useful trick, but there's a problem with it, which is what about brand new customers? So for new customers, you make an estimate from less data um, and that, and then scale it up um, to a monthly window. So let's take the case of we're, we're calculating these metrics on the 29th of January. Um, you can basically, if you're looking at customer four on the 28th of January, they've only been a customer for one day. So here I say, don't even try to calculate anything for them. But let's look at the more interesting case of customer three, who has been a customer for 19 days. Now that's not quite a month, but you can still look at the number of events that they had in those uh, 19 days and then scale it up by a ratio of 28 over 19. Um, and you get one a scaling factor of 1.48. So nine events in 19 days is equivalent to 13.3 events per month. Now let's say you have another customer who's been with you exactly a month, customer two. You find they have 11 events and you, you get it with a scaling factor of one. Um, you still have 11. But what about your older customers? You can actually make a more robust average of a multi-month measurement by using the trick from the rare events, but with a variable scaling factor. So here we say if they've been a customer for 45 days and we've had 21 events, we'll scale it down by 0.62. Um, so we get, for them, it's equivalent to 13 events per month. Now there's one Easy SQL, which handles new customers and also has the multi month averaging trick for your old customers. Um, and I'm going to show it to you in a second, but I just remembered we need to do the a prerequisite is to calculate the tenure for customers, which is how long a customer has been a customer. Because you see here, to do this calculation, I need this measurement of how long they've been a customer. Um, the easiest, the, the most efficient way to do this is to just run those. It's actually kind of complicated. So I'm just going to go in and run it. I'm going to run the metric, the tenure metric calculation, chapter three, listing 13. It's a later one in the first chapter on customer metrics. This is actually going to run it. And now for the first time, we're going to insert into our metric table. Um, we haven't inserted anything in there yet, but you might have noticed it when we looked at the schema. Um, the actual SQL here is pretty complicated. Um, this uses what's called a recursive common table expression, shown here, uh, which again, I'm not, I do an, a, an entire stream on this, so I'm not going to really go into the details here, but we need it to move forward. And let's just see if it worked. Okay, it worked. And now if we actually go now to our metric table, we should actually see something here. Um, whereas before there was none. So we have all these metrics It's number 10 and the metric value is the number of days each of these customers well, it's actually here. You can actually see it increase for customer number one. We're kind of repeating the same calculation until customer one churns. Um, they become an older and older customer. So tenure is like the age of the customer, but it's not their personal age. It's their age on the service. Now we're next, we're going to run the tenure scaled metric we looked at in the last calculation. So that will show you the trick here. So we're going to run chapter seven listing eight and this is the tenure scaled metric i'm going to run it first and then we can look at the sequel so it is using uh wait is this the right one yeah we're using um an observation period like in the previous sequel on the rare metrics and so we look at events within the observation period days we also join with the metric table to get the account tenure so i'm joining interjoining uh metric table and then we use this uh, well, we also check that the metric value, which is the account tenure, is greater than 14 in this case. 
So you can see that in the printed the filled out SQL down here. Um, and then we basically do that scaling out that scaling calculation where it's the description period 28 days, which is basically a month divided by the lesser of the observation period and the tenure. That's how we get um, the these scaling factors shown here. Uh, I think I show the SQL here and maybe easier to see. This is the, for the, this particular calculation, it's 28 over 84. And in this first version of the SQL, we actually print out the complete decomposition. This is the, the learning version of the SQL where we have the, the account, um, their tenure metric, the unscaled count and the scaling factor, and then the final result. Um, we're mostly seeing people here who are low in the tenure. Oh, uh, here's someone. Okay, here's a new, a new, no, high in tenure. So we weren't seeing that. Here's someone low in tenure. So we actually got a scaling factor greater than one. So their one event in 26 days is equivalent to 1.07. Not that much difference, but you know, that's how it goes. So the next step here for us in this demo is to actually calculate and save a whole bunch of tenure scaled metrics, which we're gonna use to do the machine learning and the analysis. So we're finally almost done with the metric calculation. Um, for those of you who find this boring or, you know, but this is still a really important part of data science. Don't forget, feature, uh, feature engineering is really the key to data science and machine learning. Most people don't realize that. All right, let me get this running and then I can keep talking. So we're going to do, I'm gonna use the same configuration. I'm gonna do, there's different versions, one for each metrics we're gonna count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I put in the dash insert flag, which tells the book, the, the run churn listing script to not use the teaching version of the SQL, but actually to use the inserting version of the SQL. So what we can see here is we're inserting into the metric table um, and we're also should be inserting into the metric name table. Yeah, so these are the, we're, we're starting to do the calculations and then this is the actual SQL is like a stripped down version. Um, and you can see these also, oh, this is the insert version that I opened for you previously. Um, it has the insert statements. And we can go check out what's going on in the database while this runs. And we'll also do some other stuff. But first, let me see if I can, let's see, look in my query history. And I'm going to start by setting my search path. Uh, oh, I need actually a new query editor, I think. This will be, this is better. So I'm going to set my search path, which is a Postgres thing. Uh, let me see if I have the, um, I want to do a join on my events to, on my metrics actually. So I'm looking for an old query, which will hopefully be the right one. Let's see, metric name. I'm trying to join metric and metric name and look at the values of the metrics. So let's see if this is the right one. Uh, this is not the right one because <laughs> this one has an error let's see what was my what was the whoopsie what was it where's my error syntax error added, metric did anyone see what that was all right maybe i should look for the right this is the problem with query histories when you save messed up versions um or i could just try to do this, you know, freehand. Let's see. What are all these old versions and which ones have the error? Okay, let's try this one. All right, so now that's working. So now we can actually see, oh, this is good. So now we can actually see details of the account tenure as well. So this is the two metrics we've got running so far. We've got account tenure, which has a minimum value of zero, average of 59 and a maximum of 123. It's a short simulation. So it's only a few months of simulated data. Uh, the metric that we've got so far is advanced stage uh, with a 28 day average, uh, but observed over 84 days. The minimum is 0.33. 
Uh, the maximum is a thousand, the average is 38. So we can kind of keep hammering on this thing as the calculation goes and we'll see when it's done. But in the meantime, let's go back and do, um, well, first I'll say a little bit more about these 10 year scaled metrics. Like why do I use such a complicated feature calculation? Um, mainly because it only has advantages and no drawbacks. There's nothing bad about it and it's got lots of good things about it. So the advantage is for the new customers, it gives you the best estimate possible with the limited available data. Now that actually really matters because new customers churn a lot. <laughs> um, the first month or the first quarter is a real risk for churn. Um, so you, if you, you don't want to wait a long time to get a good read on a customer if you really want to prevent them from churning. But for your older customers, it's also a more stable and reliable estimate by using more months. So it gives you more robustness for your old customers. You can also do tricks like making a long-term average and a short-term average and look at the ratio. Um, but this is the long-term average, kind of three month, or it could be a year if it's an enterprise product. Um, but even though you're doing one thing for new customers and something else for old customers, it's all expressed as an average per month, which means it's only one feature um, and it makes interpretation easy. So that's why I recommend to everyone to use this. Um, it's pretty much my go-to customer metric is with a 90 day uh, window and you but using that scaling for the new customers and call it all like a per month estimate. All right, another important metric, which we need, especially for today's demo, is the MRR, or monthly recurring revenue. <clears throat> now, this is a very simple one to calculate. It's like a count metric um, where you're summing the values. So it's, it's really, the, we talked about the basic count metric, but for events that have real values associated with them, it could be an amount of money or a duration in time, you can use um, a sum to get the total or an average to get the average. Here we're gonna use a sum, but we're also doing it from that subscription table. So let's go chapter three, listing 14. Um, let's actually go back to edit these calculation, the configuration, because the old one is running. This is gonna be metric calc, let's, let's call it like MRR calc. And let's see, we're gonna get rid of all this stuff. Did I just say listing, I think it was 14, isn't it? Wait, what did I say here? And also, what did I say and did they get it right? Okay, it's actually listing 14. So let's run that. And it will print out that SQL that it's running. We can look at it again real quick. In the IDE, this is the MRR metric. Standard form as all the other metrics. Um, with a date, a series of dates, and an insert statement into the metric table. But now we're going from the subscription table uh, instead of the event table. So if we go back here, we'll see how we're doing. All right, so we're, we've gotten through four out of eight of the main metrics, and we have the MRR metric. And as expected, uh, the minimum is 10, the maximum is 100. We knew that from looking at the subscription table earlier. Um, and the average is 66, so that's good. They're, they have like somewhat more, you know, high value customers than low value customers. They being, you know, the simulated CRM company for what it's worth. All right, so let's see. We have a little bit more to do, um, which is actually the most interesting metric, uh, which I, I spend a lot of time on this in the book, is ratio metrics, because ratios are really helpful. They're non-linear, so they actually you know, give you new and different information than just having the separate metrics. Um, so the ratio metric is really just a ratio between two existing metrics. So this is chapter seven, listing one. I'll go as usual, I'll run it first, or I should run it first. Um, and let's see, I should make sure, this is gonna be using the op, Opportunities closed, and I just wanna make sure, I have to make sure the underlying metrics are all calculated, so yeah. Close opportunity, 28 days. That's gonna be the underlying, and the MRR are the two metrics in this. So those are already there. 
So I should be able to run that one. And we'll look at it while it's running. Oh, this is actually just the demonstration version, actually. This just prints out. Okay, this is the demonstration version of the ratio metric. You can see it selects a numerator and a denominator and calculates the ratio um, in a simple way. But I actually need to rerun this now uh, with the insert because we actually want to use this for the rest of the demo. All right, now we'll run the actual insert calculation. Um, so while it's running, we'll note how we do the ratio. There's some important tricks here. It's the ratio of the numerator divided by the denominator, but we have to predict against divide by zero and also having no value for the numerator. So we do this case when denominator greater than zero to then you know, use the, the ratio, else we substitute zero. So we just say the ratio is zero if there's no, um, you know, there's no denominator. We shouldn't actually have that problem here because MRR is in the denominator. Now someone could have zero events, but on this product, they can't have zero MRR. So that's why it's often good to put your MRR in the denominator. Uh, any other event, it could conceivably be zero, which is just less useful. The coalesce statement is in case the numerator is zero, so we don't get a null. So it's just fill in a zero because um, we don't track zero metrics. But so now that's run and I should also, we can also, this was my original metric calculation, which is running all the other ones. Let's see how it's doing. It's not, it's still calculating. So we might have a minute to kill here. Let's see how many we've done. 11, 12, actually it might've just finished. I think that's actually it. I think it, it actually just finished. Oh, perfect timing. Wow, I am on it today. So I hope, um, yeah, we're, we're gonna dive on now. We're actually getting to the new material. So for everyone um, who was kind of tuned out because you remember this all in the book, we're actually now gonna do the analysis. So that was just me, you know, I'm an honest data scientist, so I do, I do everything. I don't just drop in with a pre-made data set. Uh, we actually have to do the feature engineering, calculate the metrics. Uh, now, the first thing we actually have to do is make the data set. Because what we've got in the database now is a tall table of metrics. If you, if you recall, well, our met I don't know if we've looked at it yet, but I think we did actually. If we look at what's in the, the metric table, let's look at the last hundred rows. <laughs> Um, it's a tall table where we're, we've got, you know, just a bunch of metrics and customers and different times. So to turn that into a data set for machine learning, we've got to go through a little process um, of identifying which customers are going to go into the data set, um, which includes both act customers who are currently active and those who are, are churned. And there are two separate steps because you identify them in slightly different ways. Uh, then when we merge them together, we've got to figure out on what dates we're going to observe these customers because generally you observe customers periodically when you're making the data set. You don't just observe them at the time that they churn. And finally, we merge them with the metrics. So the data set is a combination of observations of customers and whether or not they churned and the metrics. And there's a time lag between them too. So as explained in the book, you don't just calculate the metric right when, oops, knocked the mic there, sorry. But you don't just calculate the metric the day, the day that someone churns because generally their behavior changes you know, at the end um, before they're churning. So you want to, um, calculate, you take the metrics from about four weeks, typically, if it's a month to month software, or 90 days before the end of their subscription. Now, this is also a long subject. It's an entire stream of its own. Probably, I think I did this in two streams when I explained how to make a data set, but we're just gonna do it real quick for the demo. It's chapter four, um, and this will give us a data set to work with. So I'm gonna, I'll duplicate this and I'll call this the data set. And it's chapter four, listing one, two, four, five. What happened to three? It's like a little, it's another way of calculating it um, for event-based data. But this is the, the standard way. It runs really quick. And at the result, 
um, it's going to create our data set. It's actually filling out these tables, um, active periods uh, and observations uh, get filled out by those queries. Again, details in the book. And finally, we save a data set to our demo, our output folder, which we actually haven't looked at. But let's take a look. I don't think we've looked in there yet. So we made, when we said that we told the program this was our output folder, now it made a subfolder for the BizNet2 simulation. And now we made this data set file, um, which I will try to open for you. Okay, it opened in another window. Um, but so now it looks like actually a data set. So we've taken our um, tall table of metric uh, data and we've pivoted it or flattened it is another way to put it so that we have one row per observation per customer. Although if we look in this data set closely, we'll find multiple observations of each customer, but on different dates. Um, and we have the outcome column for whether they've churned or not. So this is like a quick look at our data set and superficially it looks okay, but we're gonna do another little trick or not a trick, but an important step. And I'm always telling this people this, check your data before trying machine learning. In fact, I was telling one of my team members this week, <laughs> we were looking at the data after we had trained a model and we saw that all these features were zero for all the customers. And I was like, this is why we check our data before running the model. But we've got a script um, that does it in fighting term with data and we'll just run it right now. Let's see, we'll do edit configurations here. I'll make a new configuration for, I call it my data set stats. It's chapter five, listing two. And if we look at it, let's take a look. It's really just a, 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 a augmented version of pandas describe, which I hope you all know. Um, you really must know pandas describe if you do any kind of data science with pandas. So we start with pandas describe and then we add a few statistics that I find are also helpful. That's the skew, the first and the 99th quantiles and also the percentage that are non-zero. And now <clears throat> in my script, it saves it out to a local directory. We'll close the big data set file. And let's go back and look at this one. So now these are my summary stats. You, probably too small for you guys to read, but I'll open it up and let's make sure the data set looks okay. All right, so let's see. Where's my zoom button to make this visible for you? So now for each metric, um, we have the mean, the standard deviation, and all these percentiles. We also have the churn variable. Um, this is this is which you can actually see the churn rate in the data set here is around 3%. Uh, not exactly the same as the churn rate calculation we saw before, but in the same ballpark. They're slightly different looks at the same period of time. So now we've got for all the metrics, the percentage that are non-zero, uh, which all look pretty healthy. Um, only one has a low percentage of non-zero values, which is the lose opportunity uh, metric. Because remember I said before, these are great salespeople or it's just a great CRM. They hardly ever lose their deals. Um, and all these other ones, um, yeah, they all have pretty sane looking values. Uh, let's see, I should make it a little bit smaller. And the MRR as expected ranges from 10 to 100. And really these are, ex this is exactly what I'm, I tell my team members, the important things to check, you know, check your outcome variable with a distribution like this. Also check your key metrics and just eyeball them and make sure you know that these numbers mean what they should. So MRR looks healthy and we can see that the opportunities closed per dollar by the customers, um, it's actually not that high, it, it, but it ranges around uh, 0.08. Some people get as high as four, but it, it makes sense because they should close multiple opportunities per month and they're paying, you know, 50 or $100. Each opportunity is hopefully worth a lot more than that. So this all looks pretty healthy. And so now, um, okay, this is just what the results will look like, although we already looked at them. And so now we will go on and actually do the machine learning, everyone's favorite part usually. 
So nowadays, everyone is pretty familiar with gradient boosting. I hope you all are. It's really the go-to method for uh, using structured data, which is da data in a tabular format like the kind we're using. You know, earlier in the stream, we talked a little bit about neural networks and deep learning. Do not use deep learning, you know, for churn data. You should be, at this point in time, boosting is the state of the art um, for structured or tabular data. There are different variants. XGBoost is kind of the original. CatBoost is specialized if you have a lot of categorical variables. Uh, LightGM is specialized for speed. Um, it's a little bit faster maybe a lot faster sometimes, and it doesn't hurt your accuracy too much. All these methods are highly accurate, but they also have another even more important property, or just as important property, which is that they're really robust to data imperfections. Um, there's no problem if you have missing values, badly scaled features, or correlated or collinear features. All of these can really ruin your regression um, and you have to, or even a neural network, and you have to do a lot of things to fix them. But boosting methods don't give a crap about any of that. Um, boosting methods used to have one weakness, which was a lack of interpretability, but that has really been solved in the last couple of years by a method called SHAP, which we'll also look at in a sec. So that's a little overview of gradient boosting. Again, actually explaining gradient boosting would be a whole nother stream. So let me just, um, do the you know uh, run the cross validation of the gradient boosting uh, and here let's see i guess i'll make a new new configuration this will be my xg boost and this is what i say chapter nine listing six was that it let's take a quick look here and we can see what the listing does i'll make sure it's the right one yeah, this is the right one, so I'll start running it first, and then we can talk about it. So this is a pretty standard uh, cross-validation. As I talked about earlier with Felipe, I don't know if you're still there in the Twitch chat, um, we use a time series split, which is like a cross-validation, but it respects the ordering of time. So it's we also call it back-testing, particularly if, if you're a Wall Street person. Uh, algorithmic traders call this back-testing, and they invented it like in the 80s and 90s. So time series split is like a later data scientist version of an older technique called back-testing. Um, but it's related to cross-validation, and you pass it into your grid search C as the um, as the you know the cross validation object is in this case a time series split. We use a few metrics: um, lift, which is kind of a common one for churn for marketers, really. Um, AUC is a is a good metric for you know judging the accuracy of churn models because it takes into account the probability of the outcome and not just the outcome. Also, a log loss is another really powerful one, although it's a little bit harder to interpret. Okay, it looks like the cross-validation is finishing. I didn't even get to finish explaining the code, but in the grid search CV, you give it a dictionary of the test parameters. Um, and yeah, most of this is actually pretty standard sklearn cross-validation. And we've now saved to our output directory several artifacts. Uh, one is a summary of the cross-validation results, which we can look at really quick. Let's see, uh, choo, choo, choo. which one is it? Uh, it's this one, okay, duh, the one that was on top. So here is, this is the output of a cross-validation in sklearn. And the key thing is I've sorted them by the perform the rank on the performance. Um, I actually use the AUC. And so the, the AUC that we get, mean test AUC shown here is around 0.8. Let's make that a little bigger so you can have a chance of e hopefully reading it. So this is fairly predictable churn. It's just a simulation. Often it's much harder to predict churn in real life. Um, <clears throat> and these are the best hyperparameters for the, the XG boost. And we've also saved in this directory, can I make this bigger? Yeah, a little bit bigger. Um, we've saved a pickle of the actual model uh, that we created. And there's a histogram of the churn forecasts. We can take a, and show you what that looks like. 
here. It's the histogram of churn probabilities from the model. Uh, remember, the churn rate is only around 3%, so naturally these probabilities are centered around 3%. And if you, that's a good check, sanity check. If you know your churn rate, your, you know, the predictions by your model should be centered around it. And you don't see any very high churn rates predicted um, because that would just be unlikely. Like if you have a customer who has like a 90% chance of churning, they probably churned already. So you're not really gonna see them in real life. I mean, it's just, it's also just not possible to have like a 3% churn rate and have customers with 90% churn. So the model doesn't predict that. Um, yeah, so we looked at the time series cross validation and the XG boost. And now let's look at the explanation. This is the fun part. So SHAP method is the shapely additive explanations. And this has been really game changing for uh, using gradient boosting and tree-based models because it has a really great, it used to be hard to interpret the meaning of those features, but the SHAP me method looks at how much does each figure contribute in the prediction, um, both in general and on individual examples. And it actually does like a test where it removes a feature and looks at the model without predictions without the feature. Um, and it has a really efficient way of doing this for tree-based models. Because if you think about it, if you were going to remove every feature and look at the predictions without that feature, that's a lot of work to do. Um, there's a lot of, you know, subsets of your, you know, of the, the features by taking one at each one out. So the end result, again, I'm not going to go into the details. This would be an entire another stream here. But the end result will be a very interpretable explanation of the boosting model. Now, now, note, you won't actually see this in the book, Fighting Churn with Data. Why? Well, I honestly didn't know about it when I was writing the book. It was a few years old at the time. I think the main papers came out in 2017, and I was writing this book in 2018, 2019. So it was a few years old at the time I wrote the book. It wasn't that popular yet, and I didn't learn about it until after the book was already going to press. So that's the life. I'll have to include it in the second edition of Fighting Turn with Data, if there ever is one. But I have included it in the GitHub repo for the book, and I did previous live streams all about the SHAP uh, explanations. So it's now in the main branch in GitHub. Um, we can run it, and I will do it now. So this is not special for this demo. This is, I, I basically added it to the, the main repo as some additional listings on chapter eight, um, just because I just thought it was, you know, so, awesome <laughs> that to finally be able to look at an XG boost model and see you know what uh what it's telling you it makes XG boost so much more usable you can really have more confidence in it when you can look at it and get an explanation all right so it's running it's taking a minute uh oh yeah let's look at the code while it's running that's what we're supposed to be doing so it's here as listing 98 my code is not that much. Basically, I'm just loading the data set uh, and, the, and the pickle of the model that we already uh, created. And then the SHAP code is I use the SHAP package, make a tree explainer, because this is a tree-based model. There's a separate explainer uh, for linear models like logistic regression or elastic net. And the, then we do a summary plot, which we'll look at in a minute. Well, actually we calculate the SHAP values, which are actually the influence of the features in each prediction. Um, so we make a summary plot and then we also do what's called a waterfall plot. And for this, it's actually an individual. So we'll look at both of these in just a moment. Um, the waterfall, the summary plot and the waterfall plot. Um, because it's saving them out as we speak, I think. I guess it takes a minute. Oh, all right, there we go. So it should be done. So now we should have the results, and let's take a look. So we have a lot more things in here. The main SHAP plot is this one. Um, and here is where it went. And I actually have a slide for this, which will make it 
more e easier to explain. So this is my slide explaining how to read SHAP summary plots if you don't already know. So the features are listed in order of most influential to the least influential. Um, so our most influential feature is the closed opportunities per month. Um, the least influential is the MRR. We'll have more to say about that in a minute. Um, now each dot in this plot, they call it a bee swarm plot because there's a lot of little dots, right? So it's like a swarm of little, you know, bees or something. Each dot represents one uh, example that a forecast was made for. And the color of the dot represents the feature value. It's a little hard to read this tiny text, sorry about that. But the red means a high feature value for the feature on that row, and the blue means a low feature value for the feature on that row. So the, and then the influence is shown on the X axis. So if the point is to the left, it's reducing the outcome probability from the average. So this line shows the, like the midpoint or average. Uh, and this point shows it's reducing the outcome probability. Points over here show that they're increasing the outcome probability. So that means that if it's on the left, it's reducing churn, or churn has been reduced by the feature. And if it's on the right, churn has been increased by the feature. Now, combining that with the color coding is how you read this. So close opportunity, we have on the left, um, the red points, the high values. So that means high values of closing opportunities reduces churn. Blue on the left means low values increases churn um, in general. So that makes sense because this is a CRM, a customer relationship management system. You want to close opportunities. So that makes sense. People who don't close a lot of opportunities, they churn from the product. They say the CRM sucks. I'm going to get a cheaper one. Uh, the next most influential feature is competition, apparently. People who have too much competition also don't like this CRM. Go figure. So here we can see that this is churn increasing because the red points are on the right and the blue points are on the left. Uh, and you can pretty much keep reading. All these features are actually pretty easy to read because my simulation is pretty simple in its cause and effect. So basically red on the left means reducing churn. Opportunities closed per dollar. Oh, remember, that's the ratio we calculated from MRR, from revenue and opportunity. Uh, searching, advancing stage. Okay, reverting stage, that's also bad. Losing opportunities, that's definitely bad, which you can see because the red um, points are on the right. Again, that's increasing the churn probability. Blue on the left. Um, note, precise results will vary from run to run of the simulation. Let's take a look at the new one this is the one i just ran they're usually similar i'm looking okay you see that lose opportunity is in a different position in the new simulation from the one i prepared earlier and some of the other ones are different too so in general when you you know th in this case we have the randomness of the simulation uh, so each time you run this simulation it's a little bit different also you have the a little bit of randomness in your XG boost fits. I've actually seen you run XG boost twice and you run SHAP twice on the same data and you get kind of different results. But you shouldn't have hugely different results. Like something that's near the top in one run should be near the top in another. And if it's near the bottom in another run, it should stay near the bottom. So that's how you read uh, the SHAP plots. Um, Let's also look at a simple cohort analysis on MRR. We'll do that really quick. Uh, let's see. That's an earlier technique in the book. Let's see. We'll do MRR simple analysis. And let's look at the impact of revenue on churn in a simple way. This is, the, this is actually the interesting part, and this is one of the main points of the whole stream. So main point coming up, here we go. I've now made a simple chart of how much people churn um, by MRR. And what you can see here, 
Well, it, it only formed two grooves, but you can see that people at higher MRR churn at a lower rate. So people paying $100 churn at around a 2.7% rate, and people at the lower MRR churn at above 3% rate. Now, how does that relate to what we found with the model? This is actually the interesting part is the significance of MRR can be hard to read. So this is a typical result from the, the simulation. If you run this yourself, it might be a little bit different, but you should get something basically like this. Single variable analysis shows that higher MRR customers churn less. Why is that? That's actually a kind of selection bias because only customers who really like the product are gonna pay the higher MRR. Or if they're not that into the product, they're gonna sort themselves out and you know they'll, they'll find the MRR for them. Um, so the MRR itself is not that helpful in reading the impact of MRR on churn. XGBoost finds the MRR feature is not very significant. It's kind of, it ranks it at the bottom in it almost every time you, you do this. Um, but opportunity close per dollar is much more useful because that shows the value that the customer is receiving. And here we see, and we saw also in the other simulation um, here, that high values of MRR close per dollar on the left, red and purple here, that means it's churn reducing when people get a good value, but blue points on the right, so low value is churn increasing, even when the significance of MRR itself is often somewhat ambiguous. And it, it, I mean, the MRR by, I should say by itself, is kind of ambiguous, because it kind of is conflating the selection bias and the underlying you know impact of money of paying a lot of money is bad right and that is part of the simulation that you know the, the more people pay it does make them less happy but it has to be balanced out with the good things that make them happy so that is kind of where this has all been going this is the main important thing about using revenue in your modeling um, is to use it as a ratio with other features now, lastly, I'll just say a brief words about, I mentioned the SHAP waterfall plots. These were also produced um, for the example in the output. Uh, here's a SHAP waterfall plot blown large. This, it actually takes the, the, the it, it shows where this customer is relative to the app, the typical customer. So it starts out with this typical uh, average and it shows how much each, uh, feature contributed to that customer. So in this case, the customer has a lot of closed opportunities per month, 7.6, much higher than the average, uh, which was not this one. The, the average closed opportunity per month is only 3.2. So for this customer, 7.6 is very churn reducing. Um, it's also this opportunity closed per dollar is helping um they're they're having a little bit of churn increasing from the addition of competition let's find someone else who's a little more interesting these all look like healthy customers oh these are only healthy customers let's look back at the slide i think i have an example on the right here is an example of a less healthy customer so you're seeing that this customer only had 1.7 close opportunities per month, so that's churn increasing. Uh, also, they have a lot of competition added, also churn increasing. So if a customer is below average or above average, you can actually see how they got there, how much each feature contributed. And this is just gold for understanding. If you wanna know for a customer, you know, how they got the forecast that they did, this makes it you know, so much more um, you know, interpretable. And yeah, that's kind of covers the live simulation. I hope you guys like the code demo. Um, I hope some people actually try to run that code. Um, you could try other features, like we could try more ratio features. Um, another thing that might be fun would be comparing the non-scaled time scaled features to the time scaled and you know look at how much difference it makes. But I basically made this simulation to illustrate those points about um, revenue in SQL calculations and revenue in modeling. So I've done all that 
And because this was a conference talk, I also included a section on challenges for machine learning and churn and a little bit about my current company, which is OfferFit. So first challenge, many people ask about how much data do you need for churn analysis? Usually you want tens of thousands of customers and thousands of churns, which is not too hard for a consumer product. Um, the lower limit where you would want to do this kind of analysis would be like 100 churns and maybe some non-churns. But if you have less than 100 churns, I tell people, don't bother with churn analysis, just get more customers. <laughs> Having too few churns to analyze is a real problem for annual contracts sought uh, B2B SaaS businesses. Um, because, well, I'll just say, be that's because um, if you have a, an enterprise SaaS business, you may only have a few hundred customers and they may, they're probably on annual contracts. So then you only get a few hundred observations per year. And if your churn rate is low, you're not going to have a hundred churns until after several years of operations. Now, if you're in that situation and you have very little data, these are the things to do. Uh, if you do a cohort analysis, use fewer cohorts. When you do modeling, look at confidence intervals and statistical significance carefully um, and really use good regularization if you use a model like logistic regression. Also, what you can really consider is using a bootstrapped regression. That's like an old school statistics method where you fit many regressions on subsamples of the data and then average them together. I think I actually did that in an old stream and if I didn't, I should. But consider not using XGBoost and just use a bootstrapped regression um, if there's not a lot of data. Uh, let's see. Another challenge of, of machine learning for churn is that unbalanced is just normal. Churn is almost always an unbalanced data problem. I mean, could you imagine if you have a churn rate of 50%, it won't take very long for your customers to go to zero. Um, I advise people against downsampling or upsampling. I mean, you would downsample the non-churns, really, or upsample the churns. But by keeping the true churn proportion in your data, you end up with a calibrated model, which is just a lot more useful. But what you do is use models that handle class imbalance gracefully. And actually, gradient boosting will do just fine on class imbalance data. Um, you might hear my dog in the background there, <laughs> but uh, gradient boosting is just fine for class and balance data. And so is logistic regression. Um, if you use proper regularization um, or a model like elastic net, which is also doing regularization, um, do not use accuracy as an evaluation metric for a churn model. Why? And by accuracy, I mean the specific metric of accuracy, which is the number of true positives plus true negatives divided by the overall number. The reason is because if you have an unbalanced data like 5% churn, it's easy to have 95% accuracy just by predicting that everyone uh, doesn't churn in this case, and then you'd have 95% accuracy. So use something like the area under the ROC curve uh, or the precision recall curve, which are both good for imbalance um, and they, they're based on the probability of the outcome. Also, um, the log loss is another good one, although it's harder to interpret. Um, the other advice I give people is to remember it's a binary classification, but it's not a binary use case, by which I mean a binary classification cl would classify every customer as churn or non-churn, but in practice that's like a useless result. What you really want is the probabilities of churn, which you can rank the customers with. Almost all real churn use cases are about ranking and not about classification. So that's why I say it's binary classification, not a binary use case. What does this mean in, in practice? If you know Python and sklearn, you should be using predict proba. Never use predict um, when you're done with your churn modeling. Um, so that's my advice on unbalanced data and the challenge it presents. Let's see, uh-oh. Having a slide freak out, it's not responding, which means that, ugh, what the heck? Okay, there it goes. 
All right. <laughs> the next problem of churn modeling and churn machine learning um, is, wow, RD serendipity. You got to bed at three in the morning just to watch my stream and it was worthwhile. Oh my God, that was the nicest thing anyone said to me all day or in a while. And wow, what time zone are you in? India? I'm trying to think. Uh, that's really great. But thank you for sharing. And I hope it's, oh my God, it must still be like 4 a.m. for you. Oh yeah, India. Well, I'm sorry. I do this time because it's like a good time for most of the world. Like people from Europe through like Australia, Singapore can watch. It's really hard to have a good time for the US and India. Wow, 5.19 a.m. Well, thanks so much for joining. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions you wanna ask. But let me say what I was what I was supposed to say here was that churn is almost always non-stationary uh, because the world is changing, your product is changing, you know, you could be in the middle of a developing recession right now. So that means the behavioral the behavior of customers changes as the economy is getting worse or better eventually. So live churn prediction models age fast. So what you wanna do is refit on a schedule, typically just every month, and then you don't have to think about it. Um, keep measuring your live accuracy, but don't wait until you direct detect drift. They say model drift, which means that your old model's not predicting so well anymore. So don't wait for that, just refit your model regularly. Also, when you develop your model, you use time series split or time series cross validation Oh yeah, it's, it's back testing uh, to people who algorithmic traders on Wall Street, time series cross-validation or time series split. But don't use the shuffle split for cross-validation. That, if you do that, it actually introduces data leakage. Just doing cross-validation introduces data leakage or look-ahead bias, which means that your model gets data to train on in your simulation that in reality it would not have because your data actually occurs in time. If you shuffle split, you're gonna train on data from the future and it will make it easier. So really pay attention to strict causality in your data set construction. Another place this could come in is using variables from the future like when you construct your data set you have to make sure every feature is really available at the time that you're constructing it okay next issue unless uh, anyone has anything to ask about that a real challenge and this is getting to the my current company is that interventions can confound your modeling so suppose you actually use a churn model and you send out discounts to high risk, churn risk customers. Although, like I said earlier, make sure they have a good lifetime value that makes it worth a discount. Um, so generally don't send them discounts, but just let's just say you do. If you send discounts to high churn risk customers, the most obvious thing that will happen is the churn rate will be lower than your predictions because the mo if the model doesn't know you're sending discounts, your churn rate estimate from the model is gonna to be too high. But there are worse things that might happen. The more pathological consequence, which I kind of describe on the slide. Now suppose some feature which predicts a high likelihood of churn and made them high risk is also correlated with the likelihood of accepting your offer. Now you're gonna have a weird situation where your model is biased. Um, if you refit your model without telling it that you've been sending discounts, it's going to think that feature predicts not churning, when really it predicts churning, but it also predicts a likelihood to accept the offer. It will also, the model will also think that those that are high risk are at low risk. So the other side of this is don't use your model to send out things like discounts unless you model your interventions systematically. You actually have to include your interventions in the model. So in that hypothetical example, you would need a feature to say, you sent a discount to them, maybe even the value of the discount offer that you sent to them. And at that point, you're really predicting the response to treatments, not exactly just the probability of churn. 
And, but when you do this, you get into a situation where you're going to try different treatments. Um, you're going to include them all in your model. And what you're actually going to want to do is explore the treatment. So this is where reinforcement learning um, is a natural fit if you're using churn modeling uh, with interventions. Um, now, this is actually a segue to my new company. Um, the reason I haven't been live streaming in like the last three or five months, it's been a while, I admit, but I took on a new job at a very exciting startup. Uh, sorry. And because it's a startup, we have a lot of work to do. So I've just been very busy getting up to speed and, you know, doing a lot of stuff at my new startup. But what is my new startup? It's called, it's not my startup because I didn't found it. I joined it. So I say it's my startup, but it's our startup, all of, all of the, the company. Um, so it's OfferFit and OfferFit basically makes a product for marketers based on reinforcement learning. We don't tell them it's reinforcement learning. We actually call it automatic experimentation because we're replacing A-B testing. You're probably familiar with A-B testing, which is when you, you know, try out different treatments and then look at the result. But the reason we say we're going to replace A-B testing is because it's just better to use reinforcement learning. When you do A-B testing, it takes a long time. It's a lot of work. You have to wait for the results. Um, we say here it's not truly one-to-one -one because you kind of look at results on averages. Here in this, we say second generation, you know, modeling is like using a static churn model. Um, like I just described, hypothetically, you could basically make a model that has your interventions as features and then refit it every month. Um, but then you've kind of got a separation between the exploration um, and it's also you know, just kind of a pain to keep refitting models. What you really want to do is have a larger system that encompasses both your interventions um, and exploring the interventions and then the modeling, which is actually predicting. And that's what OfferFit's product does. It's like a no code platform for reinforcement learning for life cycle marketing use cases, not just churn. Um, it's really the whole cycle from acquiring customers, renewing, upsell, cross sell, and of course, preventing churn. Um, so OfferFit, it's very cool. And the reason I was so excited to join OfferFit uh, is because they were taking, you know, kind of the challenges of m machine learning and use cases like churn and really just taking it head on, you know, knock them out with reinforcement learning. Um, so I'm super psyched. I'm the director of machine learning implementation at OfferFit, which roughly means um, I, ru I manage the department of machine learning engineers who actually implement the OfferFit product for our customers. So it's very exciting stuff. It's really, really fun for me doing, you know, I'm becoming much more expert in reinforcement learning, which I love uh, working with great customers. Um, yeah, really uh, awesome team. So anyway, that's my little plug for OfferFit, and, but I don't wanna like bore you talking about my job because it's not, you know, that's a product plug, not, not teaching you anything. But yeah, so now I'm basically done. That was everything from the ODSC uh, session. I took a little bit longer in the live stream than I did in the, it was a one and a quarter hour session. It looks like we're going up to the two hour mark, but I've been a lot more chatty. We looked at the code, the Twitch chat was kind of active earlier in the stream, got a little bit quiet midway through, but let's summarize. Okay, the takeaways from today's stream and my ODSC session was, Data-driven churn reducing strategies are product improvement, find what works without surveys, uh, engagement marketing, communication customers find valuable, customer success, which is onboarding and training, pricing to deliver value with tiered plans, not discounts, and targeting, get better potential customers into your funnel. And thank you also, very nice X. Very nice, act. oh my God, that's like not safe for work, <laughs> but I like it, great handle. And thank you for uh, appreciating the stream um, and RD Serendipity also, thank you for appreciating my stream. Now we looked at calculating churn rates with SQL. This was the beginning part of the stream and we compare different versions that are revenue sensitive. Net retention includes upsell. It's good for your investors, not so good for fighting churn. Standard churn, 
uh, good for products with moderate price variation, maybe a little bit of discounts. MRR churn, use it for products with large price variations because it includes the, the revenue lost from downsell in your churn. Okay, we also looked at tenure scaled customer data aggregation features. Wow, that's a complicated way to say it, but I came up with it. This is the best estimate on new customers and it's a robust and accurate estimate on your seasoned customers. So that's a great way to calculate uh, windowed aggregation features, which are pretty much the standard for all kinds of customer lifecycle use cases. All right, more takeaways, gradient boosting. Most people know about that by now, but if you don't, actually not everyone does. Sometimes people interview with me and they're using random forest. Um, and if you do an interview, a data science interview with me, you know, you get a little deduction because you're using random forest and not gradient boosting because it's just better. Uh, accurate and robust to data imperfections. Now, it used to be hard to explain tree-based methods like random forest or gradient boosting, but now with Shapley additive explanations, it's very easy to interpret. And it's so important to sanity check your model by using those. Uh, let's see, MRR, monthly recurring revenue. We looked at the impact in a realistic churn simulation. High MRR may appear to be churn reducing, but that's selection bias because only motivated customers um, choose the high MRR plan. Um, use a ratio feature like actions per dollar to see the true impact on churn. And you could also use dollars per action, like the cost per action, which is kind of more interpretable but it has the problem that then the actions are in the denominator. And you, with MRR, um, almost everyone's paying something, so uh, you don't have problems of zero in the denominator. Lastly, I talked a little bit about machine learning for churn, the various pitfalls. It's unbalanced data, the problem is non-stationary. If you're gonna intervene with your customers, you need to model interventions. You have confounding effects. If that's what you, your company wants to do, consider reinforcement learning and try offer fit. Um, uh, it's hard to build yourself. You know, it's a classic build versus buy decision. If you're a data scientist and machine learning engineer, I respect you. I know you could make your own reinforcement learning algorithm, but I promise you it's a lot of work because I do it, I deal with it every day. So consider using offer fit. All right, today's music has been provided by Leak Beats Lo-Fi. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier on that my feedback monitor was messed up. I hope the sound quality has been okay. I'm just gonna see how it was on the live stream. Uh, but Leak Beats Lo-Fi, it's great music for streaming and studying. Let's see, all of my streams will be available on YouTube, uh, YouTube On Demand. Also, I post them up really on Twitch also, but just tell your friends who don't watch Twitch that they can see this on YouTube, but Twitch is more fun. Also, there's now YouTube handles. I don't know if you, you guys know about YouTube handles, but they just introduced it. So now you can do at carl24kdatascience at youtube.com. Um, and that's how you'll get my, my YouTube videos on demand. And let's see, what else is here? Oh yeah, don't forget the discount. Um, I put that in the chat earlier. Actually, I should do that again. Let me just go to help everyone who wants to get this discount. That's, I believe, good for all products um, at my publisher, manning.com. It's gonna be, come on, go back. It's gonna be good for about a month or maybe two months even from the ODSC conference, uh, but so it won't be good forever. But anyway, so that's a 35% discount at manning.com for my book or anything else there. And lastly, thank you. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, please follow me on, well here, God, I'm saying Twitter as like Twitter is like burning. <laughs> Oh, there's 40%. Oh, right now, just, oh, an FYI. Oh man, well, can you share that discount code? Or maybe is that just on the website? Thank you, PK Patricia. 40%, uh, Manning does have discounts all the time. So I will just add, never pay full price at Manning Books. Uh, just wait around and find a discount coupon. But so yeah, I'm sharing my Twitter handle here while I'm also just getting started on Mastodon. Ooh, site-wide at Manning. Okay, note to self, that's a good one. Thank you for thank you for sharing. Um, but when it, when that runs out, my discount code will still be good for another month or two. 
So also what I'm gonna do while I'm thanking you, I'm gonna thank Pandural who followed me recently. I always do this, I, I thank, cause not that many people attend my live stream, you know, when I do them, but a lot of people follow me and watch it later. So I try to follow, I try to thank them all later. Um, Raul C80, thank you for following. I didn't, no new followers were in the stream today, I, I don't think, but I'll just quickly follow through, go through thank yous on the recent followers. The next one is Polash96, thank you for following me. And next is, well, these things take a while. If you have Streamlabs, you know how this works. Um, you press the replay and then it kind of hangs. Leap. Felipe Lorenko, are you still here? He was chatting earlier in the stream, but thank you for following me, Felipe. Um, Felipe Lorenko, as he goes by. I know he was here earlier on the stream. And nextly, thank you, Fire Knight. Ooh, that's a cool handle. I like that one. Fire Knight, thank you for following me. And, oh wait, next is someone else who was here on the stream. The, well, I shouldn't, I'm building up the drum roll. Thank you, the Laos. I know you were chatting earlier on the stream. I hope you're heal still here to hear me thanking you for following. And nextly, thank you. Who's next? Come on, Streamlabs. Sana Sane Sadu. Thank you for following me. And next we have. Don't worry, there's not too many more of these. But I gotta say thank you to people sometime. Thank you. This is a cool handle. Geek Mishraji. Thank you for following me. And lastly, for today's thank yous, is thank you. Christian. Kristen. Kristen SJ. Thank you for following me. And also thank you, thank you, PK Patricia, RL Serendipity. Very nice SX uh, for all your chat and Felipe Lorenko, uh, everyone who chatted with me today. It's always more fun when people actually, you know, chat with me. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. So enjoy the rest of your Saturday. I'm gonna go enjoy the rest of my Saturday. The sun is almost setting here in California. So it's time for me to um, 